Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Job chapter 41. Job chapter 41. Last week I had thought, uh, you know, we'd, we had uh, discussed a few things last week. We had talked about how Satan makes himself appear or his, uh, uh, what he now is. And we, we discussed him as the, how he makes himself appear as the angel of light. We also talked about him as the dragon or the serpent. And then we looked at Job chapter 41 where he's called uh, Leviathan. And uh, I thought that maybe we would, we only got through half of the chapter. I thought maybe we would end there. And then I realized this week that there were a couple of points that I didn't feel like uh, we could, uh, that I was comfortable in moving on without uh, uh, bringing up. So Job chapter number 41 is where, we're, where we'll start. And look at verse number <clears throat> 11. Job chapter 41, verse number 11. It says, Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for the time that we have in your word. We pray that it be a, be a blessing, Lord, uh, to those, and, and, and we, as it always is. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, when, when the scripture says here that who has pre prevented me, um, that I should repay him, whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. The, the Lord is going to repay, it says here, and he's going to give him what he deserves. And, and just to remind you, God is spending time here a bit on Satan because in Job what happens is Satan shows up and he's, as the accuser, he starts accusing God. God says, have you considered my servant Job? And uh, Satan says, well, he only loves you because uh, you're good to him, that you keep the hedge of protection about him. And uh, if he didn't have these blessings, why, uh, he, would, he would curse you to your face. And uh, so God uh, now shows up to Job and he he's, he's, uh, you know, tells Job to gird up his loins and he's uh, going to give him some information. And uh, in so doing, God tells him, you know, look, you know, Satan is more powerful than you, but I'm more powerful than him and I will take care of him. Um, and, and so we go th down through uh, chapter number 41. It continues in verse number 12. God, speaking to Job, says, I will not conceal his parts, nor his power. And again, we're talking about Leviathan back up in verse number 1. He says, I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. If he's not going to conceal his parts, that means you're going to be able to recognize him, right? And if he's uh, not going to conceal his power, what does that tell you? Satan's going to have some power that's demonstrated, that he still has some a power and authority that's left that hasn't been taken from him. Who can discover the face of his garment, or who can come to him with his double bridal? You know, you can bridle any animal in the world, but you can't bridle Satan. Who's going to bridle him? Nobody's going to be able to bridle him. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be sundered. So he has scales as a dragon. He's got the, this great animal, Leviathan. He's got these scales that are so close together, you can't pierce them. You can't come together with a spear and get between the scales and harm him. But you know what? What, is, what does Hebrews say about the Word of God? It's quicker and powerful than, and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, a physical sword may not be able to get through there. But the Word of God can, because it can divide asunder even to the joint and the marrow. So the only way that you can pierce the devil is how? With the word of God. Verse 18, by his niecings a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. What was Satan called? What were the angels? They were the, you know, the morning stars. Look, the issue there with the niesings, does that word sound familiar to you, to you guys, niesings? You know, what do you do when you sneeze? Niesings is the word that we get our word sneeze from. When you sneeze, it comes through your nose, through your nostrils. So his nostrils, it says, a light doth shine. Remember I told you last week Leviathan is like a fire-breathing dragon? 
through his nose. He's got his nostrils, light shines. He's got fire coming from within him. And you can see it in his nose. You can see it in his eyes. Verse number 19, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. You know, you've heard the stories before of, you know, the, uh, the, the knight and the dragon and, and things of that nature. You know, where do, where do we get the idea of a fire-breathing dragon from? It comes from the book. The fire is burning down from within him. By the way, remember we said uh, last week, what do the, a lot of the commentators say Leviathan is? He's just a big crocodile, a big alligator. Have you ever gone down to Florida and you say, stay away from the swamps, kids. You don't want the fire-breathing alligators to come out at you, right? I mean, that's, not, that's not what they tell you. You don't see fire-breathing alligators. Verse number 20, out of his nostrils goeth smoke. So he's got fire coming out of his mouth. He's got smoke coming out of his nostrils as out of a seething pot or cauldron. So you think of a cauldron, right? And you think the smoke that's coming up as it's got a fire burning underneath it. And you think of the smoke that's coming up. And that smoke there, that issue of smoke follows that dragon for all of eternity. You know, over in the book of Revelation, it talks about the smoke of their torment that ascendeth up forever and ever. And so you have the option that smoke will follow the adversary and you can go with him and take the smoking section for all of eternity. But you know, Christ died on the cross, so you don't have to go there. That smoke is going to be there, and it's going to smoke is going to ascend forever and ever, just like it does out of Leviathan's nose. Verse 21, His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. You know, I'm from coal country down in Kentucky, up in the mountains. We used to, you know, to keep the house warm at night, you'd go out to the back porch, and uh, you would take about three steps to the mountainside because down there there's no flat land. So you walk out the back of your house and the mountain's right there because they had to dig out of the mountain to put your house there. So you just walk back there with a bucket and a chisel and you'd go back there and you pick the side of the mountain and get some coal from a little coal seam, put it in the, bu the bucket and take it back in and put it in the coal burning stove that's in the center of your house that would heat your house. So back there you didn't have natural gas or anything like that to warm the house. You just had your, your yard out in the back. And this says that the, the lamps that come out of his mouth, it kindleth coals. So he's a fire starter, right? It kindles coals. And the flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. Now, if you're talking about an animal, what type of animal do you go up before and sorrow is turned into joy? You know, do you go up before an alligator and he says, Boy, I was sorrowful before I saw you, Mr. Alligator, but now I've got a lot of joy in my heart. No, that, you know, that's not generally how it works. <laughs> Turn over to Proverbs, hold your place in Job, and get Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. You know, those who follow Satan, they get a certain joy from it. Not, not like the joy that we have in Christ, but a certain joy from their folly. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's not the same joy that we get that fills us, but it's, it's, a, it's a temporary pleasure. Proverbs 15, look at verse number 21. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Of wisdom. You know, the world is out there in their own folly. They're out there in vanity and in folly, and because they're destitute of wisdom, they take joy in it. There's joy in the things that they, that they do, but there's not going to be joy there for, for long. You know, back over in Job, it talks about how the angels have been charged with folly. Isn't that interesting? It says, it Proverbs says that folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Somebody was destitute of wisdom, and, and they're being charged with folly. But when it comes to this joy that you're going to have, the joy that comes from sin, the joy that comes from Satan, you know, the scripture talks about there's pleasure in sin for a season. The scripture doesn't say that there's pleasure in sin for eternity. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but there is agony in sin for eternity. Agony, pain. So don't be short-sighted when it comes to this life. Don't have the type of joy that is, 
that is folly because you're destitute of wisdom. Comes to, come to the one who has truth, the one who imparts wisdom and will give you eternal joy that no one can take away from you. You know, not, not, not even your short-term joy, you know, the world out there living in their pleasure and that short-term joy from sin, none of that can compare with the joy that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't compare. I have more joy in serving the Lord than any amount of sin can bring me. And I don't, you don't have to take my word for it because you, too, were a sinner at one time in your life, weren't you? And you know what joy sin brought for you. It was empty, wasn't it? It was empty. But now you've found something that's full, something that's satisfying. The Lord Jesus Christ said, the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. And the joy that we partake of through the gospel and having our sins forgiven and that salvation, that's a joy where I never long for joy. I don't have to long for joy again because I have it. So the joy of the Lord, it fills us and it overflows. Back to jo chapter number 41 of the book of Job. It says in verse number 23, the flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. So the only way to attack Satan is through Scripture. And when Satan came to Christ, what did Christ say? Did Christ come back at him with a sword and say, look at my sword skills. You know, let me unsheath my sword and, and go at Satan with a physical weapon. The Lord Jesus Christ came back and said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so the way that you fight the Satan, Satan is through the truth, the truth of God's word. Verse number 24, his heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. And by the way, that, that millstone there, that's the one, the nether millstone, that's the one that you actually grind the, the flour with. That's the one on the bottom. It's the big one. Verse number 25, when he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. Now, look, you know, the issue with Leviathan here is that, you know, God may be making a parallel to some animal that had lived in the past. You know, like he, when we, we look over in Ezekiel and he talks about the king of Tyre and, the, and, and, and things of that nature and God makes parallel. Sure, there was a king of Tyre at that time, but the king of Tyre that was at that time was not in the Garden of Eden. So, you know, God draws parallels here. The point I want to make to you here is that there is, there is no animal that raises up itself where the mighty are afraid, and by reason of breakings, they purify themselves. What's that talking about there? The reason of breakings that they purify themselves. Get over, come over with me to 1 Kings chapter number 18. By the way, uh, the mighty being afraid, you know that's the reason why people sacrifice to false gods. That's the, people, that's the reason why people sacrifice to the devil is because they're afraid of him. Out of fear, not of love. But when it says, by reason of breakings, they purify themselves, what are those breakings? It's the breaking of their flesh. Um, they talk about it in our culture, some they call them cutters, where they try to purify themselves through the cutting of their skin. In 1 Kings chapter number 18, look at verse number 26. It says, and they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from the morning until e uh, uh, even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. So Elijah comes before, the, these are the prophets of Baal, right? And Elijah tells them, I tell you what, you get your stuff, make an altar, and we'll put, an alt, uh, we'll put uh, you know, the wood on the altar, and whichever God uh, answers us by fire, that's the God that we'll believe. And so you had the prophets of Baal on one side, the prophets of Satan, Baal, Satan, and then on the other side you have Elijah. And the prophets of Baal come together and they, make their, they put their, their, the, the, you know, the wood up on the altar and they start crying out to Baal to come down to answer their prayer and to, to start the fire. And, uh, and there, no voice was heard, it says. And in verse number 27, it says, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them like a good Christian. He mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be waked. 
Verse 28, and they cried aloud and cut themselves. Notice this, after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Now, when it says that they cut themselves according to their manner, what does that mean? Does that mean that's the first time that they had ever done that? They, thought they got desperate, so maybe we'll just try cutting ourselves for the first time. No, when it says they cut themselves after their manner, this is something that they were accustomed to doing. They would cut themselves in order to be heard. They were cutting themselves as they cried out to their God. They were cutting and mutilating their own flesh. They're trying to purify themselves through their prayer and doing penance to their God. By the way, that's what the Catholic Church calls it. Penance. To, you know, crucify yourself. You know they do that all over the world? There are people who supposedly worship God and they whip themselves to purify themselves. You ever heard of that throughout history? They cut them, their skins. They, they cut themselves to purify themselves. Let me ask you a question. If you understood God and you understood salvation, what good would it bring you to shed your own blood? These prophets of Baal are cutting themselves after their manners with knives and lancets, and by reason of breakings they purify themselves, is what Job 41 says. When the beast stands up and he raises up himself, they cut themselves to purify themselves. Verse number, let's go back to Job 41. Look at verse number 26. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the habergen. You know, these are, the habergen is like the, the, the thing that they use in the sea. So again, we're talking about something that's in the water. None of those things can pierce him. Verse 27, He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. If you're going to, what does that tell you? If you're going to fight the devil, you're not going to be able to fight him with, with man's weapons. Over in Ephesians, it talks about that we wrestle not against flesh. But what are the, what is it that we do fight against? Spiritual wickedness. So none of these things are going to do when you fight the devil. Our weapon are not carnal because we can't fight the devil with bullets. But yet what is it that he sends at us in Ephesians? Darts. The fiery darts. You notice they're fiery? Here you have a description of someone that's got fire from within him, and he sends darts at you to attack you, and what are they called? Fiery darts. Is that physical darts or is that spiritual? How many of you have ever been walking down the street and said, ow, oh, you got poked you know, in the backside or something like that, and you pulled out a dart? It's never happened. It's not physical. Verse number 30. Sharp stones are under him. He spread the sharp points, uh, sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot, he maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. So he's, uh, that's, that's uh, what I think that's referring to is he's out there in the deep, which is out in the heavens, and he's out there in the deep, and that's where Satan is. Leviathan, the dragon, the serpent. Verse 32, he maketh the path to shine after them. One would think the deep to be hoary. Now, I'll just throw this out there. It's, it's just interesting. He makes a path to shine, out, uh, shine after him. If, if, if he's out there in the deep that's in the heavens, what's interesting is, you know, what, are, what do the astronomers call our galaxy? The Milky Way, you know what it means to be hoary? It's talking about that's white. Like if it's a hoary head, they're talking about, a, you know, like a, a gray-haired man or something of that nature. So it's just uh, interesting. They call our galaxy the Milky Way. Um, Isaiah 27 talks about uh, God will slay the dragon that's in the sea. So here this Leviathan is in the deep, and he maketh his path to shine after him. Verse number 33, Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. Now, get, over, get, get Genesis chapter number 9. If we're, if we're talking about an animal here, and it says, Upon earth... There is not his like who is made without fear. 
we were, if you were here on last Wednesday night, we studied uh, Genesis chapter number nine. Well, not the whole chapter. We got a few verses in. And in Genesis chapter number nine, uh, Noah gets off the boat. And the first time you find the word fear used in your Bible is in Genesis chapter number nine. Noah gets off the boat and the first thing that, one of the first things that we find is in verse number two. So he, he gets off the boat and God says in verse number one, God blessed Noah and his sons and said of them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Notice what it says in verse number two. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. How many animals are left that are not afraid? So God put the fear of man in the animals because what he did is he changed the dietary restrictions. He now says to man that you can go out and you can eat. Every, the animals are now going to be of, of meat for you, they, that you can eat them. And so God puts a fear in the animals so that way man can't just walk up to the animals, that man still has to work in order to eat. Because God has a principle that if you won't work, you shouldn't eat. So then he, he makes it so that the animals are afraid of him. But over in Job chapter 41, it says, Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. So is this an animal being referenced to that doesn't have fear? I think that, I think that every animal on this earth has a fear of something. I mean, you have elephants are afraid of mice, right? I've never seen it in per person, but they say that elephants are afraid of mice. And, you, you know, animal, animals are afraid of different things. I think, uh, according to Genesis, Genesis chapter number nine, animals are afraid of, of man. They're afraid of something. But whatever this Leviathan is, he has no fear. You know who doesn't have fear? Satan. Get Isaiah chapter number 66. You know, Satan, he doesn't fear God. He certainly doesn't fear us. Over in Romans chapter number 3, when uh, Paul is describing the unrighteous, Paul uses this term in Romans chapter 3 where he says that there is no fear of God in their eyes. The unrighteous, they have no fear. Of God. Where does that unrighteous, where does that thinking process come from? It comes from Satan. Now, by the way, what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Look at Isaiah chapter number 66 and look at verse number 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and, uh, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. You know, Satan doesn't tremble at the word of God. He comes, up in, he comes to the garden, and he comes up to Eve, and he starts questioning the word of God. He takes away from the word of God and he, he distorts it. He has no fear of God. You know, we, we ask the question, have you ever thought about why it is that Satan did what he did? I mean, that's pretty audacious, right? To rebel against God. Isn't he afraid? Why wouldn't, if Satan knows he's going to lose in the end, why wouldn't he give up? But yet you read in Revelation, he never gives up, does he? He has no fear. He knows the power of God. He's not ignorant of the power of God. And yet he doesn't fear because he doesn't care about his word. So those who fear the Lord, they approach him in a contrite spirit. We shouldn't take his, his word lightly as Satan most certainly does. Back to Job 41. While you're going there, Get Isaiah 27 and Ephesians chapter number 6. Isaiah 27 and Ephesians chapter number 6. Now, Isaiah or Job chapter 41. 
We're down to the bottom of the chapter. It says in verse number 34. Now, remember that we're still talking about Leviathan here. And I hope that if you've stayed with me, maybe you don't agree with me that, that, that Leviathan is referring to Satan. Maybe you think it's an animal. That's fine. Be persuaded in your own mind. But I hope that uh, verse number 34 maybe clears things up for you. It says, he, uh, Job 41, verse 34, He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Now when it says that he beholdeth all things, I ask you to get Ephesians chapter number 6. And maybe that uh, rang true with you when you think about the principalities and the powers that are out there. It says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. We're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. Job chapter 41 talks about Leviathan as he who beholdeth all high things. Now, I don't think that that's an alligator. And I don't think that there's any doubt who he is when you compare Job 41.34 and Isaiah 27 and, and just look at what, uh, who, who we're talking about here. When it says that he's the king over all the children of pride, I don't think that we need to run any verses in order for you to know who's the king over all the children of pride. What was it, if you have been with us in our studies from the beginning when we started talking and we just did an introduction a bit about Satan, before we started talking about who he is and how he manifests himself, we talked about what was Satan's main problem? Why was it that Satan fell? Satan fell because of his pride. And ever since then, when you read in Scripture, you talk about the children of pride. They are of their father, the devil. And so when it says that he is the king over all the children of pride, what we're talking about here is Satan. Pride started with him from the very beginning, and he's the king over all of them that follow in this way of thinking. In this way of thinking, what is a prideful thinking? It's saying, I'm not interested in doing it God's way. I'm interested in doing it my way. Me, myself, and I. It's all about pride. Now, Isaiah chapter number 27, I asked you to get that chapter as well. Isaiah chapter 27, look at verse number 1. It says, In that day... The Lord with his sore and great and strong sword. Remember when we, the, the verses there about Leviathan, it says his, his scales can't be pierced. You can't pierce it with a spear. You couldn't pierce it. But what will God be able to do? Notice this. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, who is this Leviathan character? Is God just talking about, you know, there's this one, you know, old dinosaur, this old big animal that God just doesn't really like, and one day he's going to kill that animal. That's not what that's talking about. The serpent is Satan. We've already covered that. The dragon is Satan. We've already covered that. And it says, in that day, the Lord with his great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. The issue with Leviathan in Job 41 is that is a long chapter on Satan where we learn about him. So I bring all of that up to understand who Satan is. We've spent a lot of time in our study thus far just talking about who he is. So that way when we talk about his strategy, you'll know who he was when he was created as the anointed cherub that covereth, who he now is and the forms that he takes and how the Bible describes him. And now I'd like you to get Isaiah chapter number 14. Because if we, now, if we know who he is, who he was, and who he is, what is it that drives him? What is it that motivates him? What is it that, that, that the desires of his heart? You know, the desires of men heart, men's heart is what motivates their actions. So what is it that is within Satan that, that motivates him? And uh, we find in Isaiah chapter number 14 the thing that motivates him. 
to, to, to know his strategy, you know, that's the purpose of this, this series. And I promise you, we'll get there. And you'll know what his strategy is. We'll get there. But in order to know his strategy, you have to know what it is that he's desiring to accomplish, right? Because if you think about uh, maybe a battle plan or something like that, you can understand the strategy of a, of, a, of a military battle plan. But what is it that you're ultimately trying to accomplish in the end through a strategy? You're trying to accomplish victory. There's something in the end. In war, you're trying to accomplish uh, you know, defeat of the opposing army. And it's the same thing with Satan. But what is it that he wants specifically? What is it that he's desiring? Isaiah chapter number 14 Look at verse number 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So in Isaiah chapter 14 here, we find Satan's desires. We know exactly what it is that he wants. We know what it is that our enemy is trying to accomplish. And it's often pointed out in Isaiah 14 here that you have the five I wills of Satan. You have five statements that begin with the phrase, I will. This is what he's wanting to bring about and what his strategy is designed to produce. And the end goal is Satan's complete and utter authority. You know, oftentimes we talk about the authority of the Word of God at this church because we know that you need to have an authority upon which you base your understanding, your belief. If we had no ultimate authority, and uh, Mike says, I believe this, and Carl says, I believe this, but they're in contradiction and in, in opposition to one another, then they can't both be true, can they? So how do we decide which one is true? Do we let them just go and say, you know, what's true for Mike is true for Mike, and what's true for Carl is true for Carl? And so, you know, let's just all agree to disagree. Let's just all get along. No, if we're going to evaluate someone's belief system, we need to have a, a, a source of absolute authority. God has given that to us in his word. Satan wants to be that authority. Satan wants to be the one that is put in the position of the power and authority over all the universe. The theme of your Bible from Genesis chapter number 1, when God creates the heaven and the earth, all the way to Revelation chapter number 22 when he dispels the, the final rebellion and everything is done with, the issue in your Bible has been not the issue of power because Satan knows that he's not more powerful than God. Satan's not trying to overpower God in an arm wrestling match. The issue in your Bible from Genesis 1 through the end of Revelation is the issue of authority. And what Satan is wanting is he wants to be the one that's sitting on the throne and having the authority. And who is going to be the one that has authority not only over the universe, but the authority over your life? Are you going to submit to the authority of your creator? Or are you going to submit to the authority of the usurper, the liar, the one who's making himself out to be God? And that's only a question that you yourself can answer. Of course, I hope you know who has the ultimate authority. And so if you want to deceive yourself, as it talks about in Romans chapter number one, if you want to deny God and live for yourself and be one of those children of pride because you want to please yourself rather than God, that's your own prerogative. But you don't get to have your own truth. All truth flows from God, and God will deal with that authority issue. It is the, the will of Satan to have the position that God set up for his son. So in Ephesians chapter number one, we learn how God wants to make his son manifest throughout all of the universe, both in the heavens and on the earth, and make his glory manifest. Satan wants to be in that position. 
Not only does God defeat Satan with his son, but he turns around and takes the very thing that Satan desires, and his son is the one that's manifested and given the glory. Now let's look at one of these statements before we close today. Isaiah chapter number 14, look at verse number 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Where is it that Satan's problem started? Did it start when he said, I will ascend into heaven? If you read the text there, the problem actually started before that. What does it say? It says, For thou hast said in thine heart. Satan's problem started in his heart. That's where your thoughts originate from. That's where his thoughts originate from. And it's no different with Satan than it is with man. His plan of re rebellion first came from the imagination of his own hearts. Do, do you know what that word imagination means? Like, you know, today, you know, I was thinking, you hear kids encouraged to use their imagination. Use their imagination. The imagination is the faculty of your mind which forms ideas. And your imagination uses some information that you have maybe already in your memory, but it's what forms your ideas. And it is the, the, we, the will and the feelings acting upon the things that are going on in your mind. It's an image in your mind. There's a couple of words that are used to define it. Conception, contrivance, con conceit. And so when you have your mind going, it forms these ideas. And what was the problem with, with Satan's imagination? It was vain. It was vanity. Because when he, let his, when he let his mind think, when he started forming ideas, what should you form your ideas upon? I hope you're holding one in your hand. You form your ideas not based upon some willy-nilly imagination or some dream world that you live upon. But when you form the ideas that form the foundation of your life, that guide not only the way you think, but the way you act, that should be based upon your thoughts and ideas, which should be, bringing, uh, should be put captive to his word. And so therefore, your imagination, your ideas should come from a source of truth, his word. But Satan's problem is that's not where it came from. He started forming his ideas, and everything that, that Isaiah says here, Everything started with, I will, right? Satan says, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. Our attitude towards God should never be, I will, but it should be rather, Lord, what would you have of me? What would you have me do? And so Satan began with the premise of him being the authority rather than God. And what does he do? He takes his mindset and he comes down into the garden, into God's creation, and he plants a thought with Eve and says, you too can be just like me. You can be as the gods. God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because he knows when you do, then you'll be like the gods knowing good from evil. He doesn't have your best interest, to, interest at heart. And when you take of that tree, you could be something special. You could have knowledge. You could be like me. And then man partakes. And they build, man has since that time has built their mind, their thinking, their, their whole thinking process and their imagination has been vanity and putting themselves first rather than God. And the whole world now lives in a society of vanity where they put themselves first and not upon God. And then the whole world looks upon the Christian who actually bases their, their views upon truth. And they say, what a bunch of nuts or crazy people not living in reality. M meanwhile, they've built up a whole system of false belief that is nothing more than vanity. You have to watch your heart. You have to guide your heart. Anything that goes contrary to the will of God is what? Sin. Look at Isaiah chapter number 53. Isaiah chapter 53. 
The I wills of Satan is about him having it his own way. Satan shows up and he provides that alternative to God, to mankind. And he tells mankind, you can do it your own way and look at how wonderful it'll be. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number six, here's the result of what happened of man going in with Satan and colluding with him in the, the, this, uh, the ideas within their heart. It says in Isaiah 53, six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. There's the problem. The problem is rather than saying, Lord, what, will you ha what would you have me do? Everyone has turned to their own way and says, this is what I'm going to do. I want to please myself. I want to live for my own pleasure. I want to be like the Most High. I want to be the one that's in authority. I want to be the one who sets the rules. Ever since then, man has desired to have it his own way. And by the way, and then it says, the, the last half of that verse says, And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. What happens when you follow your own way? Sin and iniquity. And all of that was placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your iniquity. Who died for you wanting to go about to do it your own way and for your sin. And now by trusting in his payment on the cross, you would have for forgiveness of your sins. So ever since then, man has wanted to do it his own way. And that desire, just as it was for Satan, that desire winds up in sin. Genesis chapter number 6, and I'll show you this quickly. And then I want to turn to Romans chapter number 1. In Genesis chapter number 6, Satan shows up in the garden, he tempts Eve, and he says, you should do this your own way. And, uh, and, and Eve partakes, and now uh, mankind, when they have a child, Adam and Eve have a son, and instead of being born in the image of God, the son is now born in the image of man. And man is now all about doing things his own way. He has a sin nature. And in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 5, we learn what happens when man does it his way. In verse number 5 it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, notice that word imagination show up again there? And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, that's a good representation of how Satan is too. Satan started thinking that way, and every thought of Satan's heart is only evil continually. He shows up in the garden, he gets man to join in along with him, and if, and you know, when Satan showed up and tempted Eve, did he tell Eve about all the ne negative repercussions of leaving God behind and doing it her own way? Did, did he tell Eve what the world was going to be like with the rampant sin that would have been happening? You know, the, the kidnapping, the, 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 the sexual immorality that was taking place, the, the, the murdering, the life being taken. And it says, Satan didn't do any of that. But every imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of man became only evil continually, and it grieved God in his heart. And then it brings about the flood. The Bible calls it, by the way, you notice what it says there in verse number five? The Bible calls it evil. You know, there is such a thing as evil. It's not misguided. It's not, um, you know, well, they're troubled or they're misguided. We shouldn't soften the blow on sin. We shouldn't soften the blow on evil. We try to make excuses for people, but that's not what God does. Turn over to Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. And what we see in Romans chapter number one is Paul lays bare this thinking of, of the wickedness of rejecting God's way for man's way. Romans chapter number one, look at verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, there's their thought process again, and their foolish heart was darkened. What is a fool? A fool is someone who in their heart says that there is no God. That's a fool. And when they knew God, 
They put him out of their minds. They know God. God is there. And in their thinking, they say, I want to do it my way. And they remove God from their thinking, from their thought process. And it says that they became vain in their imaginations. They became vain in their thinking. And they removed God. Because when you remove God, what have you done? You've removed truth. You've removed right. You've removed morality. You've removed everything. And now it's based upon vanity. What was the main, one of the main characteristics of Satan? Over in Ezekiel, it talks about how he was wiser than Daniel, his wisdom. It says that by his great wisdom, he was lifted up. He became lifted up with pride as part of his wisdom. And yet, he comes to Eve and tells her that you too shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He tempts Eve with the wisdom. But yet in the wisdom of man, what does man do? In their wisdom, they become fools by, not, by rejecting God and not basing their life upon who he is. Now I ask you the question, how is it that we combat that thinking? How is it that we combat the issue of of thinking, doing things upon my will and, and how Satan comes about and tries to move people off of the right way of thinking. Get 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Timothy 6. And if you were in Sunday school this morning, we, we left off just short of 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. Notice what it says in verse uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth richly all things to enjoy. Now in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, they're talking about those who suppose that gain is godliness. And so there's a sense of the riches being high-minded. But you know who else is high-minded? You know, those who think that they know better than everyone else, those who are conceited with their knowledge and with their wisdom, that's exactly what Satan was. And so the scripture warns you not to be high-minded. That's exactly what it says over in Ezekiel, that because Satan was so wise, he was lifted up with his wisdom. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And here is really how we deal with the thinking process. And so I guess if you, if you can take something away from this thinking process and the vain imaginations and the heart being evil continually and how Satan went about down this road of saying, I will, I will, I will. And if you just remember one thing on how to combat that, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 5. You know, just if you, if you look back up we're in verse number 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If your weapons are not carnal, what do you have left? It's not your hands. It's not your feet. What do you have going on in here? Casting down imaginations. So we're not going to build imaginations and go on upon fanciful thinking and leave God behind. We're going to casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we cast down vain imaginations we neither exalt ourselves or anything else. Because when you understand what Christ did for you, you don't exalt yourself. You don't exalt other things. We bring into captivity our thoughts to the obedience of Christ. And we live our lives with the mind of Christ. When Christ came and he's before, uh, when he's praying to the Father, what did he say? Did he say, Lord, I will. He said, not my will, but thine. And if Satan would have started off with that mindset 
and that premise of his thinking, we wouldn't be talking about what we're talking about now. And so if you want to understand how do you combat that way of thinking, you approach his word with a humble and a contrite spirit, and you say, Lord, not my will, but thine. And you let his word work through you. And you don't fall for what Satan's ministers, as we'll start talking about in the coming weeks, when Satan's ministers come along and they start preaching a false gospel, you should be able to recognize it. You should have the discernment to know what it is and to spot it as being false. Let's pray. And Father, we love you. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the warning that's contained therein. And though we find ourselves in a fallen world, Lord, we're thankful for the source of truth that we have, the light that gives us wisdom and knowledge, and that we know how to combat these things. Most of all, we're thankful for your Son, who gives us the ability to have life and to have it abundantly, and to experience joy, a joy that the world, Lord, just cannot understand, cannot fathom, until they've put their trust in your Son and have the wonderful eternal hope of heaven and all that comes with it. We're thankful for these things and our own hope. In Christ's name, amen.